Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, among the topics today, education reform. Mike Crossy from the PSEA, he's the president of the Pennsylvania State Education Association, is going to talk about a new initiative called Solutions That Work. And then Dave Patty from the Pennsylvania Business Council, going to get into a little Marcella Shale and what? The state budget. Of course, it's budget time. We'll be back in a moment. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, welcome back. A couple of weeks ago, we had uh, a, house, a House member, Seth Grove from York. At that time, he was talking about a bunch of education initiatives. I said we were going to, you know, get some other views. We try to bring all views on this program. Mike Cross, he's the President of PSEA is also a teacher, not in the classroom right now, but he's a teacher, right? right. Special education teacher, president of Pennsylvania uh, State Education Association. They have a huge initiative called Solutions at Work. Michael, great Thank to you. have you here. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. Right. Uh, I'm really glad. And we're excited. We're excited to roll out this new program. Yeah. We call it Solutions at Work. So often in Harrisburg, all we hear about is politics. We decided, let's talk about policy. And let's talk about policies that work for the kids that are in our schools. We've got 1.7 million students in our public school system in Pennsylvania. And what we should be doing is talking about what works for them. Yeah. So we put together a book that's about 104 pages. There's no union issues in there. It's just things that work for kids. Work for cool. Yeah, okay. Well, let's talk, yeah, let's talk about some of those. One of those, and I'm going to let you pick the two or three sure. that you think are important. But the, because we talked about school safety with right. Seth Grove, Representative Grove, and I said I particularly wanted to have you on to, to talk about that. Ensure school safety. What, get, it, get into that. What do you think needs to happen there? Most schools are very, very safe. But we have a good dozen or so school districts and school buildings that need serious work. Students are afraid to come to school. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers are afraid to come to school. Our education support professionals. You know, what we need to do is take a look and design programs for those schools. School resource officers is probably one of the most effective programs. Uh, we need to take a look and see what works in those. But to be honest, it's not just a school problem. For those schools that have safety issues, it's a community problem. Right. And what we need yeah, to do good, is we need to point. work on the community because what goes on outside in the neighborhood is what comes into the school building. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of whether it's violence or threats or any of that. Almost all of that stuff starts outside mm -hmm. the school building. So it needs to be a community-wide program. We need to work with the local police officers, local resources, and make sure that our schools are safe from the ground out. One of the issues yeah. we really push is, uh, you know, anti-bullying programs and good mental health programs. Right. One of the other considerations, you know, as uh, someone who spent his whole, um, you know, spent my whole life in education, I mean, this concern about the dropout rate, and right. you, you hear much about it, and... Mm -hmm. And what, what, what are some of the sort of practical things that you think need to be done? So some of the easiest, most practical things we need to do is a strong parental involvement program. We need to involve our parents from the time they're young, from the time the kids get to school, until they graduate. And in most school districts, my school district, Keystone Oaks out in Allegheny County near Pittsburgh, if we lost a student to a dropout, it was like, oh my gosh, what happened? You know, but other school districts, we've got a handful of school districts that people want to focus on, and you got a 40% dropout rate. You know, what we need to do well, that's is... that's just unacceptable, isn't it? It's totally unacceptable. Every child that graduates saves the taxpayers $175,000 per year in, in resources, whether it's uh, community sources, criminal justice, uh, social service programs. We need to work on those kind of things, not just for tax purposes, but we need to work on those things so that every child comes out of our schools successful and ready yeah. to be a contributor. Yeah. Mentoring programs, parental involvement programs, a mentoring program between elementary school and middle school, between middle school and high school. Right. Those kind of things make a yeah, world of difference. Re yeah, related to that is the fact that some, as, as you know, kids come with, with varying experiences and varying knowledge levels. There has to be some individualized, some tutoring that goes on, or Absolutely. else they can't keep up. 
And sometimes it's not the student's fault, it's not the teacher's fault, it's the situation they find themselves in, right? Exactly. Uh, we have 42,000 students in our public school system who are students w that struggle with English language yeah. learner concerns. Yeah. You know, we need to have special programs and separate funding so that we have educators in those school districts. You know, in some school districts, 80, 90 percent of the students are different language speakers than English. Yeah. We need to have special programs so those children are as smart as everybody else, but at the they same need, time, yep. they need to be taught differently. All right, I'm talking with Mike Crossy, uh, uh, Pennsylvania State Education Association has a new initiative called Solutions That Work. We're going to talk about a couple more of those solutions that work in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation, educating citizens and business leaders about important public policy issues and civic affairs. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by BetterSaferRoads.com. To voice your support for safer highways and less traffic congestion, visit BetterSaferRoads.com. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Well, here we are, Solutions at Work. This program is a solution at work. We've been on the air 17 years. That was shameless self-promotion. I shouldn't do that at any rate. Mike Crossy from PSEA. All right, one of the other things that uh, you, you're, you have a concern with has to do with class size. Absolutely. Class size is probably one of the things that has the most beneficial results for our students in terms of social skills, in terms of achievement. There's one study that's been done that says that between the black and white achievement gap that sometimes exists in our schools, you can improve that gap by 38% just by having smaller class sizes in kindergarten through third grade. Mm -hmm. You know, small, small class sizes, especially at the lower levels, do so much for our students. We can identify problems, we can individualize instruction, we can help kids stay out of special ed programs. We can reduce the dropout rate just by getting kids off to a good start and getting them moving. In some of our poorer communities where they don't have the resources to work with their children before they come to school, there's as much as a 60% gap in between what students start with and where mm -hmm. they go. You start with that kind of gap. Yeah. Smaller it's class also, sizes it, can help close that. Yeah, it's also fascinating that in higher ed where I spend my time, that a lot of colleges and universities do a lot of promotion based on small classes. I mean, you hear that. And sure. I've taught large classes and I've taught small classes. You know, sometimes you have to have large classes and, and you know, just can't, they're unavoidable. But it is interesting that a lot of people tout, just as you're talking about, mm -hmm. the benefits of small class size. All right, let's, one of the other things that I know is near and dear to your heart as someone who taught uh, special ed education is uh, the programming, what, what, what's, would you, you know, the thing that you would cite if you had to change the way special education programs operate, what would you suggest? I, I would do two things. One, we need to fix the funding formula for special education. In Pennsylvania, special education funding has been frozen for five years now. Five years straight, no increase in funding, and we know those costs are going up. So those costs have a tremendous impact on local school district budgets. The other thing I would do is the new PDE rules say that special ed IEPs near, need to be geared towards grade level goals. What we need to do is we need to do that on individual goals. You know, I taught special education almost my entire career. And I might have a student in ninth grade who's reading on the third grade level. Well, for him to try to meet ninth yeah. grade goals, what we need to do Doesn't is we need to- Doesn't make any sense, Makes it? no sense yeah. at all because you start off that low, there's no way they the catch other, yeah. up. The other thing, maybe I, I want you to come back and we, uh, I'm gonna take, you know, take advantage of the, your past experience about, about mainstreaming, should they, you know, you, you hear conflicting mm -hmm. reports now about how you know, special education kids, you know, where should they be mm -hmm. in terms of with or not with 
other other students and how that all worked. Maybe you'll come back. That's something that I think we ought to talk about. The last thing I want to get into is access to arts education, extracurricular activities. Without getting political about this, there isn't any doubt that that's usually the first area that gets cut. Am I right or wrong? You're right. And so, but it's also a way to entice students to stay in school. Not only entice Not. students to stay in school, but you're 100% right. I actually had a student when I was teaching middle school, learning support students, who came to school for his art class. And I've had other students who came to school for their phys ed classes. Yeah. And that's yeah. what kept them coming in the door every single day. But at the same time, there's also evidence that a good arts program, a good well-rounded arts program that includes some theater, includes uh, you know actual drawing and painting and mm -hmm. all those kind of things, which I'm not really good at. Me neither. But there, <laughs> is, there is evidence, research-based evidence that proves that those students enrolled in art programs do well do better in, in academic other, in other programs. Yeah, yes. yep, yep. So that's a great you're, point. You're right, it's, it's a well-rounded yeah. student helps achievement in all levels. Okay, well look, I wanna thank you for c coming in. You'll keep us posted on solutions at work. All right, Dave Patty's coming up from the Pennsylvania Business Council. There's a bunch of topics I wanna talk about, an important Supreme Court case. Uh, the business community's concerned about the state budget. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, well, we're back with uh, Dave Patty. He's the president and CEO of the Pennsylvania Business Council and a regular, uh, obviously represents the folks in the, business, uh, in, in the business community in our state. And Dave pays a lot of attention to policy issues in the state. Dave is always welcome. Thank you. All right, one of the things I thought we might start talking about is Marcella Shale. As I think everybody knows, it's a huge now part of the, part of the industrial fabric of our state, a big employer. We get both lots of people who are very satisfied, you know, want the drilling. On the other hand, they want it done environment. You know, there's right, that, sir. right, combination environmentally sound. And you can do both. And yeah. you could, yep, okay, sure. Now, one of the issues that came up has to do with an important state Supreme Court decision about zoning and who gets to determine uh, the rules and regulations for how, what takes place on these actual drilling sites. Talk, get into that a little bit. Well, yeah, the, the, why, the, the, first of all, why is that important? Why should any of our viewers care about that? Well, I mean, this, this is huge because as you said, Marcellus itself has, has created an influx of billions of dollars to, uh, to Pennsylvania. Um, and and for, for viewers, no matter where they are, even Philadelphia, where there may not be any drilling going on, your electric bill at Pico is cheaper because there's more gas in the system. Pennsylvania has moved up to one of the leading energy producing states in the mm -hmm. nation. And as a result, prices are going down. So that's, that's good for us uh, across the board, no matter who you are, whether or not there's a well on your property or not. Um, but the Supreme Court looked at Act 13, the law that the General Assembly passed with a lot of work a couple of years ago, not just a willy-nilly, let's get something out the door. Um, and in that law, we said, look, we can't have 2,500, because there are 2,500 municipalities in Pennsylvania, different rules about drilling and location of wells and, and the set-offs from water supplies and schools and things like that. So the state said, yes, we have the municipalities planning code that allows for local planning and zoning and land use, mm -hmm. but we're gonna set statewide standards relative to these things and preempt the local governments there. Um, that falls in a 160 year old tradition or, or legal precedent known as Dillon's Rule, which right. is across the country. And it was a, a Judge Dillon who said, municipalities are creatures of the state. So in other words, a, a municipal government can only do what their state tells them they have the power to do. The reverse of the state relationship to, to the federal government. Um, and uh, I, I love 
Chief Justice Castile, an old friend from 1985 when he first became DA in Philadelphia, but I think he's off base on this decision. So, so his court decision <clears throat> basically sided with uh, local governments that filed suit that struck down state regulations, in effect, parts of the state law that would regulate zoning. When we, when we redid the Constitution in 1968 in Pennsylvania, we put in uh, that all Pennsylvanians have a right to clean air, clean water, a, a, a clean environment. Nobody disputes that. I mean, in, in, in this day and age, business people believe in environmental protection and protecting human safety and, 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 uh, and health, and that's not an issue. The presumption on the court's decision, though, and what I disagree with, is that only the local governments can do that, that somehow the state of Pennsylvania doesn't have the ability to do that, yet we have a state Clean Air Act, a state Clean Water Act. I mean, we do that all the time where we balance the, so the right, needs of the environment and, and the safety of the environment and, and people with development. So right now, the way it stands with this Supreme Court decision, 20, you, you would say, tell me if I'm wrong, put words in your mouth, 2,500 municipalities can now set the rules. Well, that's, that's, that's what it seems the to open it the, the door to. Okay. And, um, and, 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 and if, it's, if they can do that for drilling, can they do that for all kinds of other things? And at what point do we say, gee, we can't have statewide standards and, and there's no, nobody knows what the rules are to play with. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of these companies have drilled in multiple municipalities, uh, dozens of municipalities, yeah. and, and, and that just becomes, a, frankly, compliance goes down when you don't know what the yeah. rules are. And from what I can gather from just you know, my reading of it, it looks like now there'll be multiple lawsuits all over the place about whose rules apply and well, under what and, circumstances. And in fact, you know, a lot of municipalities don't have their own rules. Don't you know, have any rules. So, so some did uh, early on, but most of them didn't once the state started taking this action. I got it. So actually the oddity of this is that the, the state Supreme Court threw out rules that protected human health, safety, and the environment. To, to, to go to no rules. Now, right. what Governor Corbett has said, I think, appropriately is, look, no matter what the Supreme Court says, I'm saying we're still enforcing the rules. <laughs> we're still going to okay. go by this. This is a industry. little technical, but this is obviously an important consideration right. here. We're going to run to a break. When we come back, uh, Governor Corbett, big budget message coming up February 4. Ask uh, David what he thinks, uh, reaction to the business community. We'll let him react before the governor issues. He can always come back afterwards. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. Hi, welcome back with uh, Dave Patty from the Pennsylvania Business Council. We just got into this whole business with Marcella Shale on zoning. I know that seems a little in the weeds, but, but these decisions made at the court level and also obviously in the legislature are very, very important to consumers as well as to the business community and to the environment. So we're going to keep you posted as they develop. All right, Dave, uh, in anticipation of the governor's uh, budget uh, address on February 4, it's maybe one of the two or three things every year that's widely anticipated by folks in the government, business, political, labor, et cetera, communities. Uh, what, 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 what's the expectation from the business community? Do well, you I mean, think? I think everybody knows it's going to be a tough budget year, tougher yeah. than last year. Um, we have structural issues, the leading one of which is, is pension issues. Um, under current law, uh, meeting our pension obligations means $600 million more this year than last year because of unfunded pensions for That'll state be, workers and teachers. They have to be in the budget, taken care there. of in the budget. Right. And then, of course, we know Medicaid, you know, medical expenses right. always go up, so Medicaid goes up, corrections tends to go up. So we're looking at something like a billion dollars completely out of the hands of the General Assembly or the governor to stop from happening that's going to increase. So you start a billion dollars down. Uh, that's, that's a lot of money, yeah. and, um, and it's tough. You know, last year, uh, much to my chagrin and that of other business uh, leaders, the capital stock and franchise tax, which was supposed to expire years ago and had been extended and extended and extended. That's a complicated was tax. Two years more. Yeah, that's a complicated tax we've talked about. Right. So we don't need to go into assets the, the tax, of business but, uh, community. But, but we've ahead. paid several billion dollars more than we would have under the original 10 year phase out plan, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be watching for that one. Okay. 
obviously, well, for a long time, we've all talked about we need to get the corporate net income tax down, but that's not going to happen this year. That can't possibly happen. Um, no one's going to raise a personal income tax yeah. or any other or taxes, sales, in, tax. In, in, in sales tax in an yeah. election year. But how so about it's, niche it's taxes? How about, look, we hear an awful lot about I expanding gaming. Now, we've seen what happened in New Jersey, where I think for the first time, the New Jersey gaming revenues, I'm going to be wrong about this, fell below, was it $3 billion? Something like that. In other words, yeah. they're at their lowest levels of revenue production. Well, part of New Jersey's problem is Pennsylvania was, was beating That's them. That's true. So we're taking yeah, now we're, yeah, so, we're so keeping Pennsylvania our money in our but, state. But, you know, yeah. how, how many times can how you about, go back to that well? I mean, we just did something with Small Games of Chance where really we pretended it was for uh, small businesses, but yeah. the state's taking 60% off the top. What about Kino? What about... Uh, Internet gaming. Well, I think we'll see that. I don't know that we've heard the last of uh, privatization of the lottery while the governor withdrew the deal that, that we were originally yeah. looking at. Anything to get more money through gaming. I think anything to get without more money. Without any tax hikes. Uh, without, without any of the hikes. big tax hikes. I mean, there are some, there's a, a bill out there from Senator Mensch um, that I have some reservations about, frankly, that would auction off all of the people who didn't change, didn't shop for their electricity. And the expectation is it would bring the state $300 million mm -hmm. in one year. Um, it's attractive to the state for that reason. I frankly have some reservations of what it does to energy prices right. in, in the state and, and have some questions about that. But they but are looking for everything. But you think gaming anything. just maybe if we do gaming, it just costs us on the other end where people the social don't, problems? I think well, we have, or they don't go to casinos. Well, uh, there's always that problem. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, I think the cost benefit on gaming is yet to be completely answered. Uh, whether or not that's the way to fill the budget. Um, I mean, but first and foremost, we've got to do something about pensions. I mean, for the business community, it's it's what can we do to help you on pensions, pensions, and pensions. So yeah. Mike Crossy, who was your guest in the first segment of the show, would like to have more money for education. We, we spend $27 billion, which is a lot right now. Um, but uh, I think, uh, you know, I would, I would say to Mike, the first thing we have to do is, is take care of the pensions because mm -hmm. that's eating our ability to do other things in education. Yeah. Uh, yeah, other people, have, and for the state. other people have made that point that the right. actually getting in the classroom, put money in a classroom is being eroded. It's not that we're not spending more money in education, so that's yeah. going to the pension yeah. funds. Yeah, yeah. And that's no fault of the teacher. Yeah, uh, we have a little more than a, uh, a, a minute left. But do you think, given the governor's position, that he would support what we call niche taxes? I mean, can the state assume a $1.2 billion cut to the budget? and? Politically, is, I mean, that would, wouldn't that? Yeah, I, I won't presume to, to, to talk for him on that. I mean, we have looked at yeah. fees, obviously, in, in, in user fees, like, like you know, to, to fund uh, transportation right. and the uh, the impact fee for, uh, sure. for Marcel Shell. So I, I think they would be willing to look at fees that are directly tying the benefit Tied the to service. something, but not yet. I mean, no one expects income tax, sales tax hike, or even, you know, business, general business but tax But if it's a user fee and, 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 and That's the service the and the fee are, are linked, okay. I think uh, everybody looks at that. All right. All right. Thanks for coming in. Uh, we're going to follow this Marcella Shell business and probably have somebody on from the environmental community hear what they think about it. All right. We'll be back uh, next week, as always, for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and you stay well.